Bashi Harrison is the author and illustrator of the best-selling Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. She is an artist, author, filmmaker with a passion for storytelling. She earned her MFA in film and video from California Institute of the Arts, where she snuck in, oh, snuck into the animation illustration studios for Disney and DreamWorks Legends. Uh, there she rekindled a love for drawing and painting. Now she uses her love of bo for both film and illustration to craft beautiful children's stories. Not only is she an author and illustrator of Little Leaders, but she is the author and illustrator of Little Dreamers, visionary women around the world, and the illustrator of many, many other books, all of which we have for sale at the cafe. In less than two weeks, she's coming out with a new children's book that she has illustrated for actress Lapila Nyong'o called Sue. And in November, she's coming out with another new book, Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History. Today, Vashti is going to give us a brief talk, read us a story, and then she's going to do a live drawing demonstration. Afterwards, we'll have audience Q&A, uh, and then the book signing after both programs. Without further ado, please join me in giving a big Harrisburg welcome to Ms. Vashti Harrison. Perfect. All right, I like to stand up. I feel like I'm at church. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing? Thank you for coming out so early. Uh, this is my first trip to Harrisburg, although I feel like, you know, according to the name, I belong here. This is really nice. Um, I want to share with you guys a little bit of the backstory of how I created this book, Little Leaders, Bold Women in Black History. How many of you guys have seen this book before? Yeah, how many of you guys have read it before? Okay, that's a lot of you. Um, but maybe some of you guys may not know this story. Um, this book came out, wow, almost two years ago now, um, in 2017. Three years ago, I wasn't doing anything like this at all. I wasn't an illustrator, I wasn't an author, I had no idea that I would be here with you guys today. Um, the way this story started was back in around 2016, I had this feeling that I wanted to pursue um, art as a career. Um, my, my, I studied film and I was working in the film industry, but I felt this kind of calling to go back to this thing I loved from childhood, drawing. Does anybody here like to draw? Okay, good, because I'm gonna show you a, um, a little bit about how I draw later today, and you guys are gonna leave here with some of my secrets, okay? Um, but I was a little bit scared, and I wasn't sure that I could you know, one day become an illustrator, illustrate a whole book, but I had this idea um, around February 2017. Do you guys know what February is? It's a, a special month we celebrate something. That's your birthday. <laughs> Um, well, in America, we also celebrate Black History Month in February, and I've had this feeling that ever since childhood, we kind of, I, in high school, in elementary school, in middle school, it felt like I was hearing the same stories kind of over and over and over again. I wanted to treat Black History Month a little bit differently this year and kind of challenge myself to do something different. So I was really excited about drawing, so I thought, why don't I treat Black History Month like a challenge for myself? I'm going to draw a person every single day from Black History and teach myself something new. But I wanted to um, break free from some of the names that we always hear all the time. Some of the, you know, there's some heavy hitters, some popular ones out there. The uh, Martin Luther Kings, the Rosa Parks. I wanted to, you know, learn about people that really don't make it into the mainstream too much. So, um, when Carter G. Woodson founded Negro History Week in 1926, he was a historian, and he had this idea that we should celebrate the stories that have been long neglected throughout history. So I thought, you know what? This might be a good opportunity to me, for me to celebrate the stories of black women in particular. 
um, because their stories have kind of been doubly neglected throughout history. So it was just a little project for myself. I thought I would post it on social media, kind of challenge myself, get my followers to like keep me going. And I had no idea that this would blow up like it did. I mean, I knew kind of from the very first one um, that people, that the likes were coming in kind of hotter than normal, that people were kind of excited. So. I wanted to, you know, I could have drawn some of these figures um, representationally. I could have looked and tried to make Rosa Parks look like Rosa Parks and make Augusta Savage look like Augusta Savage. But I also wanted to do something different as well. Um, I wanted to create my own character and be able to turn that character into anybody um, and use her as kind of a model to learn about these cool people. Um, the reason I did that in particular was because I just read this article. Um, it was a study that came out from, um, I think, the Georgetown School for Research, um, that it was a study that said um, young black girls were viewed as less innocent and more adult than other girls from their same age group but different demographics. Um, and that just broke my heart. I thought, you know, it took me a long time to really feel like I found myself, kind of feel like I grew up. And so the last thing I would have wanted was for someone to treat me like I was an adult sooner than I was ready for that. And so I thought, you know what, I really want to make these really sweet, beautiful images that are just the right size for young readers, for young people to look at, and maybe see a little bit of a reflection of themselves, and maybe use this as an opportunity to also learn about cool people. So amazingly, it blew up way faster than I anticipated, and before February was over, um, I had signed a book deal to make three of these books, and less than a year later, the first one was out. So it's been a wild, wild ride. Uh, the first one, Little Leaders, Bold Women and Black History, came out in November 2017. Um, the second one, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World, came out. Um, last year, November 6th, 2018, and then this, this November, the third one, Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History will come out. Um, but more than, more than anything, more than you know, making books and, and making drawings, I really realized that I have this passion and love for sharing these stories with people, especially young people, because you know, part of me um, really questioned you know, even up until a couple of years ago, I really questioned, um, you know, if I could follow art as a career path, or you know, I I wondered, you know, there's this question that a lot of people ask young people, um, and maybe some of the young people in this room have already been asked this question a couple of times. Can you guess what I'm thinking of? What do you want to be when you? grow up. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that question. I don't like to ask anybody that question because it's really hard to know. I, you know, I had no idea that I would be here, you know, three years ago. Um, but more, so because of that, I wanted to fill these books with all the stories of very diverse um, paths and fields of study to encourage young people to know that there are so many opportunities out there for them. Um, so if you guys are with me. I'm going to read a couple today. Is that all right? I'm going to read some from Little Leaders and also from Little Dreamers. I'm going to go sit in the comfy chair. You guys with me? Okay. Now you can follow along if you have the book. All right. So I really like to start with um, one of my favorites. I think I have a soft spot for the artists, so you know, don't judge me. But I really love the story of this woman, Augusta Savage, who's right on the cover. She's right there. Now she's on page 26. OK, so Augusta Savage was born 1892 and died in 1962. She was an educator and a sculptor. Here she is. Augusta grew up in a poor family with 13 brothers and sisters in Green Cove Springs, Florida. As a child, she had no toys to play with, but she loved to make things. 
Augusta spent, her, spent time in her backyard where the soil was rich with natural red clay. This was where she learned to make miniature animals for herself and others. However, her father did not approve of her creativity. Even though it meant angering him, Augusta continued to sculpt. In 1921, she moved to Harlem, a prominent African-American neighborhood in New York City. At the time, the community was experiencing an exciting boom in the arts known as the Harlem Renaissance, and Augusta was a part of it. She thrived artistically, but this did not change the hardships of racism that were still prevalent in the United States and around the world. Augusta openly fought racial prejudice in the art world and was labeled a troublemaker. She said that she was standing up not only for herself, but for future students of color. Augusta dedicated much of her life to teaching and encouraging young people to pursue their artistic passion. She felt that their creations could be a part of her legacy. In Harlem, she opened her own school, the Savage School of Arts and Crafts, and she became the first director of the Harlem Community Art Center. In 1939, she created Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as The Harp. Despite her artistic success, Augusta struggled with finances and racism until late in life, but she always found a way to keep making art. Now here she is, and in the background, I kind of drew um, one of her most famous pieces, The Harp, um, and a few of her smaller ones. Now the reason this story means so much to me is particularly because it's quite sad. It was very hard for her to continue continue making art. And, uh, but it's just really special and amazing that she kept going. And every step of the way was a struggle, but she still knew what she wanted to do. And she knew that she wanted to help young people in that path as well. And so I think that's a really great testament to, um, to following the thing that you love and you know, knowing that it may not always be you know, a Cinderella story at the end, but um, the fact that she started these schools was so beautiful. Um, the first story that I wrote before this was a book, when this was just my, my little challenge for myself, was uh, Sojourner Truth. So I had known about Sojourner Truth. I definitely knew her name as an activist, an abolitionist, a women's rights activist, but this this is the thing that changed for me when I started working on books like this. I read her story, and I was writing about her, and I drew this little picture of her, and it was really early in the morning, like 3 o'clock in the morning, I was going to post this drawing, and I was just crying my eyes out because suddenly she wasn't just this person in, you know, this figure in history. She was a human being. She was a real person. She was a mother with feelings, and so that's what changed for me, and that's what I realized is, is what I can bring to these books is this, this empathy and this connection to these stories, and I really longed for the ability to share that with, with other people. So I'm going to read her, and then I'm going to read one from, from Little Dreamers, okay? So if you want to follow along, Sojourner Truth is on page four. Sojourner Truth um, was born circa around 1797 and passed away in 1883. She was an abolitionist, women's rights activist, and advocate. Um, Sojourner was born enslaved in upstate New York under the name Isabella Baumfrey. Under the state's General Emancipation Act, she was due her freedom in 1827. When she realized her slave owner was planning to keep her enslaved, Sojourner ran away with her infant daughter in tow. But this came at a huge cost. She had to leave behind her five-year-old son. The slave owner sold Sojourner's son to a plantation a thousand miles away in Alabama. Meanwhile, Sojourner remained in hiding in New York until her freedom was official. When the coast was clear, Sojourner filed a court case saying her son had been sold illegally. She was one of the first black women to file a court case in America, and even though it seemed nearly impossible, she won. She got her son back. In 1843, she changed her name to Sojourner, which means traveler, and became a preacher. She traveled the, the country, sharing her messages for women's rights and the abolition, abolition of slavery everywhere. Although Sojourner could neither read nor write, her voice carried far. In December 1851, she gave a speech that, made, that she made up right on the spot. In it, she advocated on behalf of black women who faced double discrimination of racism and sexism and had often been left out of the fight for equality. The speech is known by its most famous refrain, Ain't I a Woman? 
She went on to encourage African Americans to fight on behalf of the Union in the Civil War, for former slaves to be given places to live, and for the desegregation of streetcars. She was an agitator and a fierce ad activist for equality. So that's Sojourner Truth. Um, and now I would really love to share one more with you from my second book, Little Dreamers, Visionary Women Around the World. So this one was a very, like, a special book for me because, you know, as much as I, I saw myself in the stories of, of these incredible black women in history, um, I definitely, you know, identify as an artist and there's something really special about the stories of creative people that, you know, can be so encouraging. So I wanted to share a lot of these stories and I was mostly interested in this um, intersection of create of art and science um, because we often associate creativity with, with art. Um, but there's this one special woman who I want to read her story, Ada Lovelace, who really thought that there was this incredible connection between art and science and that you can really only understand an idea if you can approach it from multiple viewpoints. And I really hope that that, that can open up the minds of young people to, to seeing the power within them and the creativity that they have. So if you, if you have little dreamers, um, you can follow along on page six. So Ada Lovelace. You guys can see, was born in 1815 and passed away in 1852. Um, she was a computer programmer from England. What happens when imagination and technology collide? Well, Ada herself was a physical embodiment of such a collision. Her father was the poet Lord Byron, and her mother, Anne Isabel Milbank, loved math. Perhaps the combination of her parents' sensibilities was what made Ada so special. Her unique view of the world meant that she didn't just dream of being a fairy. She also knew she needed to devise a way to fly. Ada grew up during the Industrial Revolution, a time when scientists and artists gathered to discuss new inventions and creations. At one such meeting, Ada saw the mathematician Charles Babbage demonstrate a mechanical adding machine. Ada asked Charles to mentor her, but he turned her down at first. He was working on something new, the analytical engine, inspired by mechanical looms used in the textile industry. To prove herself to him, Ada translated an entire, entire Ada translated an Italian article about his new machine into English. She added her own notes, making her translation nearly three times as long as the original article. She understood that the analytical engine could be programmed to do limitless tasks and described a formula for programming it to calculate a mathematical sequence of numbers known as the Bernoulli numbers. Ada had a vision of general purpose computing a century before anyone would build one. Although Ada and Charles finally worked together, they never built the analytical engine. Ada's contributions went unappreciated until the 1950s, when her translation of the article was discovered. Her work on the Bernoulli numbers is considered the first ever computer program and made Ada the first computer programmer. Ada believed firmly in what she called poetical science, the synthesis of creativity and technology, and that human imagination could be combined with technology to kickstart the future. Um, so that's Ada Lovelace. And I feel like, you know, working on this book, one, I had to learn a whole lot of new stuff. Um, experimental physics, um, beta decay. It was a very intense learning process. Um, but one thing that I felt was kind of a through line with a lot of these people is that they were very misunderstood for a lot of their lifetime. A lot of people just couldn't get what they were seeing, and that's why I called it visionary women. They saw this future, this vision of the future that not too many people could see. Um, and, and I think what's special about some of them is they knew that people may not get them in their lifetime, but their work could live on, and, uh, and I think you know, it's an incredible thing. So um, there are 35 more or 34 more women in this book to learn about and a bunch of little extras. Um, and uh, as of earlier this week, the board book edition of this one came out. So if you're not ready to learn about beta decay and experimental physics, we have the, the, the simplified one for toddlers as well as, uh, so that one's called Think Big Little One, and then the board book edition of Little Leaders is called Dream Big Little One. Um, so those are also available in case uh, some of the words in this one are a little tough, even for me, but I think that's what's fun about reading.
Okay, so really quickly, I would love to show you guys some of my drawing. Do you guys want to see how I draw the little leader? Okay. It's actually very, very sophisticated, so you have to pay very close attention. It's like a heavenly glow coming in. All right, I'm gonna do this freehand. So it may be a little bit wonky. That's my way of saying, like, don't judge me if it doesn't look perfect. Okay, so most of drawing, almost all of drawing is learning how to take complicated things and simplify them down into shapes that we all know and understand. So I'm gonna start with a circle, but the best thing about it is that it shouldn't be a perfect circle. It should be a little bit smushy, kind of like if you took a hamburger and kind of smushed it down a little bit. Okay, you guys do that. The next step, now this is the part where you have to like pay a lot of attention. The next step is the letter C. You guys know how to draw the letter C? Yeah, kind of looks like that. I'm gonna take that C and roll it onto its belly to draw some eyes. And I'm gonna take that same shape and flip it upside down to do some eyebrows. I'm gonna use that same shape to make a nose. And I'm gonna flip it over one more time to do a nice big smile. Can you guys do that? It's pretty, it's pretty complicated, I know. Now I draw the little leader's eyes closed because I like to imagine that they're these little kids dressing up as these famous people, kind of imagining themselves in the world of these incredible legends and leaders. Um, but you're more than welcome to open up their eyes. I really like this kind of style. It reminds me of the illustrators that I love from this period called the mid-century period of illustration. Um, people like Mary Blair. Um, have you ever guys seen? Have you guys ever seen the um, Little Miss Sunshine or Mr. Happy books by Roger Hargraves? If you look at the cover of Mr. Happy. It's called Mr. Happy. He doesn't have a huge smile on his face. He's not cheesing. He's got his eyes closed and he's got this very sweet smile. And to me, that's the epitome of sweetness. And that's what I wanted the little leaders to feel like, especially because I was thinking about that study that I read. And I wanted to make these, especially the first book, I wanted to make these little black girls just feel so sweet and adorable. Um, I didn't need them to, you know, I didn't want them to feel larger than life, you know. It may be hard to live up to the idea of Sojourner Truth or like Oprah, um, but hopefully these are like easy, comforting little characters. So now from this shape, I can literally turn it into anybody. Um, I might keep going and add some hair. Like if I wanted to do my hair, I might add like one big C, another big C. It's a little bit poofy. Actually, this looks a little bit like on the cover. Um, Ida B. Wells, she, she has this nice big Victorian outfit on. So she's got these big poofy collar. So sometimes I might do a lot of this part in pencil and go back over and choose my favorite lines. I'm, I had to learn a long time ago that a lot of making art is about making mistakes and being comfortable with that. One of my favorite uh, quotes is from this artist, this person who was a uh, instructor for artists and animators at the Walt Disney Studios. His name is Walt Stanchfield. And he said, each one of us has 10,000 bad drawings inside of us. The sooner we get them out, the better. And I think that's really, really true. Because, like I said, I didn't, I wasn't always drawing. I wasn't always planning on becoming an illustrator. I liked to draw when I was a kid, but I stopped for a long time. And I picked it up again when I was in film school. Now, show of hands, how many of you guys think, like, after I stopped drawing for about six years, how many of you guys think when I started again, I was about as good or not really good? Pretty good? Not really good. 
you guys are right, I was not very good at all because I learned very quickly that if you don't practice something, you're not gonna be good at it. And so that actually made it so much easier for me to know that, oh wow, it's not that I can't do it, I just need to practice at it. And so in that way, it became so much easier to just keep going. Okay. So this one came out a little bit wonky, but you know what, I can keep going. My favorite thing about drawing hair is that if you keep adding more and more layers, it starts to look more and more like hair. And I'm actually just still using that C shape. It helps make it really feel like there's hair here, like different strands of hair. And what really takes it to the next level is when you just break free of that line and you add a few little squiggles. <laughs> Honestly, I promise you, it starts really looking like hair, especially if you do this with pencil or crayon. Okay, so I could keep doing this forever, but I'm gonna wrap up here because we're going to hear another story time. Oh, we'll take some questions. How about I keep drawing a little bit and um, We'll have a mic around, or you guys just want to shout out. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come around with a microphone. And uh, if you have any questions, please just go ahead and raise your hand so I can come right over to you. Oh, we got one right here in the front row. Hi. How does she draw? <laughs> with lots of practice, I guess. Why don't you answer that? Um, I... Everyone thinks that because I'm a professional drawer, that I draw for a living, that it's always easy. It's not always easy, it's not always perfect, but I always keep going because I love it. Um, I love drawing, painting, making mistakes, so you just keep going. We have another one right here in the front row. What are the names? What are the, what are their names? What are their names? The names of the little leaders? Um, they don't have any names yet. Um, I like to think of them as blank slates, but you could you could create one just like you just like I showed you and give it a name yourself. I'll be right back for you, okay? We have one right back here in the back. What's your favorite story in Little Eaters? My favorite story in the first book, Little Leaders, might be uh, Bessie Coleman. Um, has anybody read that story? She's a, an aviatrix, an aviator. She learned how to fly when people told her that girls in America don't fly airplanes. And she, she was like, okay, I'm gonna go to France and learn how to fly. It was really cool. Um, and she knew that um, like her sense of style <laughs> was an important part of her job. So she was just a cool lady. Okay, we have another one here in the front row. Do you draw every day? Do I draw every day? No, not every day. Okay. I do like to draw a lot, though. We have just a couple more questions. Okay. How do you get rid of artist block? How do I get rid of artist block? Oh. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, when I have work that I have to do, drawings that have to get done for, you know, hair love or soul way or something. I always draw something for myself for fun. I practice doing things that I don't like. Sometimes I put on a timer and try to draw five different types of hand. Um, sometimes I stop drawing and I go read a book where I watch TV for a few minutes, hours, days, and then I come back to it. <laughs> All right, I'm all the way up here in the far corner Woo! past the sprite, the white okay. light, okay? What's your favorite color? My favorite color, oh, it changes uh, seasonally, weekly. Right now my favorite color is yellow. Of, of all the women who you could have chosen, how did you end up with the ones that you did choose? Yeah, that's a good question. So the first book, I really wanted this survey of people from as many fields of study as possible. So yeah, we have a doctor and a lawyer, but also like an engineer, an aviator, um, a filmmaker, a photographer. So I wanted as much uh, diversity in that sense. And you know, I wanted to highlight names that are not so big in the mainstream and then add in a couple big ones, heavy hitters, just in case this is someone's first introduction to black history. Okay, unfortunately we're out of time for questions for today.